Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, the Taliban talks about respect for women. We talk with some who are frightened and hiding. Afghan women, Afghan girls are not victims, right? They have been victimized. Plus, Afghanistan emerges on the campaign trail. Also tonight, federal leaders hone their messages to parents about childcare. When you have a family of three children, you're looking at $2,400. We're in Haiti at the heart of the quake's devastating impact. This is one of the hospitals in the disaster zone that's doing its best to treat the injured. And new vaccination policies in Ontario and Quebec. If you're not vaccinated, you cannot work. Who they're for and when they're coming. This is The National. Survivors of Haiti's 7.2 magnitude earthquake are facing incredibly difficult conditions, downpours, landslides, and a lack of medical supplies. But even as international aid flows in following the weekend's disaster, the situation is getting more dire. The scale of loss is enormous. The quake has affected about 1.2 million people, nearly half of them children. Local estimates are that 1,900 people have died with thousands of others injured. Hospitals are struggling to cope. Now, the coastal city of Lekai was hit the hardest. And the best way to show the damage and how people are coping is to go there. That's what our CBC News team did today. Ellen Morrow shows us the human suffering and the efforts to help. Haiti's pain echoes in the agonized scream of this little boy. He's had this gaping open wound on his wrist for three days as overwhelmed doctors struggle to help. He needs to go to the OR, so we're just trying to get the dressing all so he can get the Do you have any pain meds? Yeah. This is one of the hospitals trying to do its best to treat the injured in the disaster zone. You can see how overwhelmed it is. There are still people who are waiting to get in, waiting to get treatment. You can see this woman right here uh, relying on these people to help her out of a wheelchair to get the treatment that she needs inside. But what we're being told is that this hospital doesn't have all the supplies it needs to help these people who so desperately need care. Some, including the elderly, languish on stretchers outside. This man's leg was injured as he desperately fled his house before it collapsed. He tells us that he can't get medicine even as he sits outside the hospital. Some of the seriously injured are transferred by helicopter an hour away to the capital, Port-au-Prince, but here too, hospitals are stretched. This Canadian aid worker is helping triage the wounded. We're reaching capacity in a lot of the hospitals that we'd normally uh, transport to. So we're really trying to get some uh, more equipment out to the hospitals that are in the south uh, so we can uh, better equip them so they can stabilize and keep the patients down there. Humanitarian agencies are working with the U.S. Coast Guard to get aid to the disaster zone. Much of it is being taken in by air, with the risk of gang warfare on the main road from Port-au-Prince only worsening already complicated logistics. Adding to the misery, Tropical Depression Grace brought torrential rain last night, as thousands are forced to now live outside. Today, cleanup efforts are ongoing as hope quickly dims that any more survivors will be found. What remains is trauma. This man's home was spared, but he fears it still might collapse in an aftershock. He tells us he's always thinking about the earth shaking and that all the homes around his have been destroyed. So much suffering for a people who've already suffered so much. A tragedy, its true toll, still yet unknown. Now, Ellen, the death toll did rise today, and you mentioned the scope of this still isn't clear. Can you talk to us about some of the challenges in trying to determine that very thing? 
Well, there are so many challenges, Andrew. We spent a lot of time at the airport today talking to aid workers. And one issue they say is that a lot of the remote villages in the disaster zone haven't even really been reached yet by emergency crews days after uh, the earthquake. So it's perhaps obvious to say this, but it's still important to say this, that that death toll is almost certainly, without a shadow of a doubt, going to rise in the days to come. Ellen Morrow on the ground in Haiti. Thank you. Let's turn our attention now to the federal election campaign and one of the issues a lot of parents are paying close attention to, the cost of child care. Evan Dyer shows us how two main parties are taking two very different approaches. Daycare is lots of fun. Of course, they don't have to pay for it. When you have a family of three children, um, you know, there's a few discounts, um, but really you're looking at $2,400 a month, which is more than um, most mortgages. The Trudeau government put $10 a day daycare in its last budget. Since then, his government has been making deals with provinces that want in, most recently Quebec, which will get federal dollars to finance its existing system. This is real change you can count on. In real terms, it means cutting fees in half by the end of next year. $10 a day childcare in five years or less. We're going to help them immediately. Our plan comes into effect when we're government, not five or six years from now. We're helping all families. Conservatives and New Democrats say Canadian voters have heard such promises too many times before. The Conservatives are promising tax credits for parents with bigger credits for lower income earners. We're going to help all families and lower income families will have 75% of the costs covered. So we're going to empower families to, to make their decisions and we're going to support all families immediately. Two different views of how to emerge from a pandemic. One would put more money in people's pockets but wouldn't reduce costs or create new spaces. The other would reduce costs and might create more spaces but no tax credits. Some economists, though, say cheaper daycare would mean more women can enter the workforce. When they work more, they pay more taxes. For every $100 Quebec has sunk into subsidized child care, they have received $108 back in new personal income taxes. But subsidies don't automatically translate into spaces. In Quebec, where subsidized daycare has existed for years, there are currently 50,000 kids on wait lists, and the number of spaces has been shrinking, not growing. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. Now, day three on the campaign trail saw some of the leaders branching out, one heading to B.C., another holding a first rally. So let's start there in Ontario with the Conservatives and Hannah Thibodeau. Aaron O'Toole left his virtual hotel studio in Ottawa to campaign in two hotels in the Toronto area. And while other leaders have been out in public spaces, O'Toole has had little face-to-face -face interaction with everyday voters. He says his telephone town halls allow him to connect with more people. Well, in the last few days, we've spoken to over 50,000 Canadians directly. I've taken their questions directly, many of whom um, we've never met before. The Conservatives will hold rallies with just party faithful, like the ones tonight. And O'Toole and his team feel confident campaigning like this in a pandemic is a better way to connect with all voters. I'm Olivia Stefanovic with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh in Vancouver. Here in the Lower Mainland, he is promoting an industrial strategy to bolster domestic manufacturing. For years and years, we've seen Liberals and Conservatives allow manufacturing to be eroded to the point that we were not producing some of the most important equipment that we need in our own country. We want to stop that trend. Oh boy, this is so good. Singh is the first federal leader to visit British Columbia during this campaign. Stopping and riding is held by the Liberals and Conservatives. An aggressive approach indicating the NDP is optimistic it can add to the 11 seats it won here two years ago. So let's bring in Chief Political Correspondent Rosie Barton. So Rosie, we're only talking day three of the campaign, already a sense of how very different it is. Yeah, it, it sure is. It's the first national campaign during a pandemic, so we expected it to be different. But we're also now seeing and hearing people who don't support COVID lockdowns, the vaccine, or in this case, the Liberal leader's approach. For the second day in a row, in a GTA riding, the Liberals are trying to take back from the Conservatives. Justin Trudeau faced anti-vax and anti-mask protesters. Take a look. Are you here to unmask our children? 
This does happen on a campaign, of course, that you would encounter protesters, but this particular issue around public health, lockdowns, vaccines, this is something quite different. I will say that the Liberals could see this as an opportunity in that moment. Their Liberal leader calling on people to get vaccinated to highlight, again, that they believe vaccines should be mandatory in some circumstances. So I know it's just a moment, and that moments can sometimes feel like over-amplified. So yes. if, if we step back, what is the overall feel? The, the pace is so different than past campaigns, for sure. Today, for instance, marked the first day the Conservative leader physically campaigned outside of Ottawa. He's the first to hold a rally of any kind tonight. Uh, it's the first day the Liberals are getting on a plane. It's the first day any leader has been to B.C. to campaign. For, uh, that's Jagmeet Singh. The pa pandemic is restricting movement and big rallies, which is where political parties can get momentum and energy. But it's mid-August. Canadians may not be entirely engaged yet. And so some of those big political announcements or big campaign moments Moments are going to have to wait until after Labor Day or even the debates when people typically start paying more attention. All right. I know you are always paying attention. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks. Now, the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan is having an impact on Canada's election campaign. Just hours ago, a plane arrived with 92 people who had fled Afghanistan, a mix of Afghan nationals and Canadian citizens who actually left from a third country to land here. Sources tell CBC News the Kabul airport is now secured and Canada will send planes there directly starting Wednesday. And as the Taliban settled into newfound power in Kabul, political leaders in this country showed that Afghanistan has certainly entered the Canadian election. David Cochran explains. The situation in Afghanistan remains grim and uncertain, but there's an emerging clarity on how the parties will deal with the Taliban. Canada has no plans to recognize the Taliban as the government of Afghanistan. That's a shift from just last night when a top cabinet minister suggested otherwise. The Taliban is saying that it wants to run as a government, but uh, we're going to wait and see. There's just such a, a lack of leadership in the Trudeau government. Wait and see was never an option for the Conservatives. Erin O'Toole says Canada has fallen short in its efforts to rescue interpreters and others who helped its mission. So Canada needs to stand up, and Mr. Trudeau is late. Um, he, he's now in an election. What we need to do is we have the back of anyone who's at risk. The challenge right now uh, is the situation on the ground. Uh, we are there, we are working with our allies uh, to ensure that we are bringing as many people out of Afghanistan as possible. The situation on the ground changed faster than Canada could adapt, as the Taliban seized control faster than Western countries believed was possible. This while the people Canada promised to help hid in safe houses. Many forced to leave their refuge to fill out forms and paperwork at internet cafes as the country collapsed around them and Canadian diplomats fled Afghanistan. Justin Trudeau has ignored those concerns for a long time. He could have acted a lot sooner and now we're at the 11th hour and it is very desperate. Justin Trudeau may not have anticipated this crisis when he called this election, but he can't avoid it now. It dominates the daily question and answer session with the media. He's adjusted his campaign schedule to accommodate briefings and the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom wants the G7 to meet to develop a response. David Cochran, CBC News, Mississauga, Ontario. So the Taliban held its first news conference today and tried to appear to show the world a more moderate face. A spokesperson said Afghans who worked for the U.S. and its Western allies need not fear for their safety. He also said women's rights would be guaranteed within the limits of Islamic law. But early reports suggest the new regime is sharply curtailing the rights of women and girls. That is of grave concern to women appointed as judges in the Afghan legal system. Shayla Bernstein shows us why they now live in fear. Once again, the streets of Kabul are under Taliban patrol. This time, the militant group says it will respect women's rights. But we spoke to two Afghan judges, both women, who doubt that. I'm afraid because I am judge and for Taliban members uh, just being a judge is uh, enough reason for to be killed. 
especially women judges are more in danger. We're not identifying these women for their safety. They say any hint that they worked for the courts could be a death sentence. We love our country, we loved our jobs, we didn't want to leave, uh, but now we, are, we have to leave uh, to be alive. Another judge told CBC all their achievements have collapsed in one day, saying, I have burned most of my documents as they have started checking houses one by one. We spend our nights with no sleep at all. Advocates say there's no evidence the Taliban has changed. They might say things to the world. The world might promote, might promote this new brand of the Taliban, but we don't believe them. We never believe them. The Taliban have not changed. They are a terrorist group who do not have respect for human dignity. Potentially supporting those claims, unverified reports of deadly car bomb attacks targeting Afghans who work for the courts. The window of opportunity to, to assist them is becoming smaller and smaller. We are urging um, that governments consider um, that they these women be included in the special arrangements that are being made for um, interpreters and other people who have directly assisted. Canada's special immigration measures for Afghans now include female leaders. One of the women we spoke with says she has applied and now her only hope is to leave the country she tried to reshape. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Toronto. Quebec prosecutors are set to charge Major General Danny Fortin with one count of sexual assault. Fortin's lawyer says he believes the charge is related to an alleged incident sometime between January 1st and April 30th in 1988. Most recently, up until May of this year, Fortin had been serving as the head of Canada's vaccine rollout. Okay, turning to the pandemic now and an issue that has seized Canadians across the country, mandatory vaccinations. Well, today, some big developments in two of Canada's largest provinces. Alison Northcott takes us through it. Montreal nurse Navid Hussein says he felt a duty to get the COVID-19 vaccine. It's important, right? We need to be able to protect patients. We have such vulnerable populations coming into the hospital all of the time. Soon, COVID vaccinations will no longer be optional for Quebec healthcare workers in close contact with patients. They'll be mandatory. It means that if you're not vaccinated, you cannot work in the healthcare system. While 90% of Quebec healthcare workers have at least one dose, the Premier says those who don't represent a real risk. The Canadian Medical Association and the Canadian Nurses Association have been calling for policies like this. The stronger the vaccine mandates, the safer our communities will be for everyone. But some say it takes away a personal choice. We, we do favour the fact that people do get vaccinated, but then it's also an individual right so it's something, you know, it's private. New mandates are coming to Ontario as well. Healthcare workers in several settings will have to prove they're vaccinated, have medical exemptions, or take regular COVID tests. I would obviously prefer that everyone I'm around is fully vaccinated, but have to respect people's personal choice. But for schools, some Ontario teachers unions say the province's plan doesn't go far enough because while it would require teachers to disclose whether or not they're vaccinated, it doesn't make the shots mandatory. What we'd really like to see is a vaccination mandate, both for, um, for educators and for, uh, for students, uh, with obviously appropriate uh, exemptions. Quebec is still working out details about what will happen if employees refuse to comply. Hussein says while most of his colleagues have their shots... There are a few that are still hesitant and they, they need a little push. He hopes this will convince more people to get theirs. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Toronto's major sports teams will be introducing new health and safety protocols for those wanting to attend games in the fall. Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment says starting next month, all staff and fans will have to show proof of vaccination status or a negative COVID-19 test in order to enter their venues. So that includes Scotiabank Arena, BMO Field and several MLSC-owned restaurants. Ontario is now offering up third doses of COVID-19 vaccine to vulnerable people, but the U.S. may be heading towards booster shots for everyone. As Christine Birak tells us, there are questions about that around the evidence and the ethics of it. 
With COVID infections rising, Ontario says it's time to offer some people a third shot of vaccine. We are preparing aggressively for the fall. I am sorry to say I think it's going to be a difficult fall and winter. Which is why transplant recipients, blood cancer patients and those on certain meds can now get a third vaccine dose eight weeks after their second. And people living in long-term care and other high-risk group settings will need to wait five months. Early results from an Ontario study suggest frail older adults do not mount as strong an immune response for COVID-19 vaccines as younger and healthier individuals. Effectively, there's a significant proportion, perhaps as many as 20 percent, of people living in long-term care who don't have enough antibodies after two shots to, to fully protect them. Researchers say this could explain breakthrough infections in some fully vaccinated seniors. Beyond vulnerable groups, though, the World Health Organization insists to date the evidence remains limited on any widespread need for booster doses. Still, reports from the U.S. say the Biden administration wants to start offering boosters for most Americans eight months after vaccination, even though most of the world hasn't had access to any vaccines yet. To not be used to keep people alive is really not just epidemiologically not sound, but it's morally um, reprehensible. Two years ago, I had a double lung transplant. In Manitoba, Shannon McMartin is hoping other provinces will follow Ontario's lead and offer booster shots to high-risk groups. People may think it's not a big deal, but it's a big deal to me. It could save our lives. For now, Canada's National Advisory Committee on Vaccines is not recommending third doses for anyone, but they'll be meeting soon, and their advice could change by the end of the month. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Ontario is also moving to expand its eligibility for vaccination to include all youth turning 12 this year. So starting tomorrow, 11-year-olds who turn 12 by the end of 2021 will be able to book their vaccine appointments. They can get the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, that being the only one currently approved in Canada for kids 12 and up. And Saskatchewan has approved a third vaccine dose for residents in order to facilitate international travel. It's because some countries require visitors prove they've had two doses of the same mRNA vaccine. So now Saskatchewan residents who got a first shot of Pfizer and a second shot of Moderna, for example, would be able to get a third shot to match. Those who got AstraZeneca would be able to get two more doses of an mRNA vaccine. Well, across the country, efforts are ramping up to reach the unvaccinated directly in their communities. Stigmatizing doesn't help. Judgment doesn't help. Up next, we visit one of Ontario's least vaccinated areas to understand what's fueling the hesitancy. And later, my conversation with a teacher in Afghanistan. The world will listen to Afghanistan and Afghan women right now. So why not? Let's take our chances. Let's fight now. What she wants women and girls to know about her country. Plus, frustration and loss in BC's interior. I had a meltdown yesterday. Total meltdown. I'm just tired. We're back in two. Now, as people across the country gear up for a federal pandemic election, today people in Nova Scotia voted in a provincial one. Chris O'Neill Yates is in Halifax tonight. And Chris, you have an update for us. Well, CBC News is projecting a progressive conservative majority win here tonight, and that is a massive upset in Nova Scotia politics. The Liberals went into this election buoyed by a strong pandemic performance, but early on, Ian Rankin's Liberals' momentum evaporated as the opposition came out hard. PC leader Tim Houston was relentless in attacking the Liberal record, specifically on health care. 70,000 Nova Scotians without a family doctor, not enough long-term care beds, and frontline workers complaining of being burnt out. Now, in recent days, the polling numbers showed the race was getting tighter. Many predicted it would be close, but this outcome tonight that has the PCs resonating with voters is something unexpected. Premier-designate uh, Tim Houston reiterated his health care commitment in his acceptance speech here tonight. I will give you everything I have to fix health care. I will give you everything I have to make this a better province. It won't happen overnight, and it will cost money. Uh, but if we work together, we can get the job done.
Now, this result tonight makes history. It's the first election in six provinces and territories where a government has not been returned to power. The magnitude of this loss cannot be overstated. A lot of people in the Liberal ranks will be wondering what happened. In his concession speech tonight, Ian Rankin said he would continue to leave the party, but there's no doubt the voters of Nova Scotia have sent the Liberals a very strong message tonight. Andrew? Chris O'Neill Yates in Halifax tonight. Thanks. Up next, my conversation with an Afghan teacher in her home country. I'm wondering, what chance are you taking having this conversation? Why Pashtana Durrani is choosing to speak up now. But first, the Taliban say they've changed, but how plausible is that and how are Afghans navigating the uncertainty? Women will be afforded all their rights, uh, whether it is in work or other activities, because women are a key part of society. And uh, we are guaranteeing all their rights within the limits of Islam. Well, quite an apparent shift in tone for the Taliban. What you heard there is from their first news conference since taking control of Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, and most of the country. But can the Taliban possibly be believed when they say they've changed? Thomas Deck looks at who they are, who they were, and what it might mean for the world going forward. Who would have predicted this? A female journalist in Kabul facing a Taliban spokesman who calmly answers her questions. The last time the Taliban ruled Afghanistan, women were barred from almost every job and they had to cover their face. Is this really a new Taliban? Afghans aren't convinced. At the moment, they are trying to show that they have changed, but it wouldn't sustain. Kabul beauty shops were quickly covered up when the Taliban returned. Yes, they claim they'll now respect women's rights in line with Islamic law, but history has shown their interpretation to be cruel and unforgiving. It was the Pakistani Taliban who shot Malala Yousafzai on her way to school when she was 15. I am deeply concerned about the situation in Afghanistan right now, especially about the safety of women and girls there. The Afghan Taliban's founder, Mullah Mohammed Omar, was rarely seen and died eight years ago. Now it's Abdul Ghani Baradar serving as their de facto leader. With their white and black flag flying in Kabul, this is the Taliban at their boldest since the U.S. invasion in 2001. While we firmly and strongly oppose the Taliban regime, we are friends of the Afghan people. At the time, the U.S. accused the Taliban of harboring al-Qaeda. But remember, in the 1980s, it was the CIA who supported guerrilla forces that transformed into the Taliban. Last year, the Trump administration struck a deal with them directly for American troops to pull out. We have had no hostile interactions, no attack and no threat uh, by the Taliban. Once Western nations are done their evacuations, Afghans fear the worst. The Taliban are back in charge and soon there will be no one left to stop them. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. No matter what the Taliban says, it is what the Taliban does that horrifies. For women and girls, there is real panic that gains they've made are about to be erased. Pashtana Durrani has heard from many of her students in recent days worried their dreams are over. She is a teacher, human rights advocate, and executive director of LEARN. That's a nonprofit working to make education more accessible for women and girls in Afghanistan. We reached her in a secret location because she too is hiding from the Taliban, fearing for her safety. I understand that, that you're in a location we're not talking about. I, I know there is risk associated, but you're still willing to talk with us. And, I, and I'm wondering, what chance are you taking having this conversation? I cannot wait for another white man to come and rescue us, right? We have to fight our battles. We are empowered right now. We have the tools. The world is looking at Afghanistan. The world will listen to Afghanistan and Afghan women right now. So why not fight now? You're not afraid of 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 people coming to your location? How, I, I, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like, and I, I can't. We already have been through so much drone attacks, civilian abuse, government abusing you, Taliban abusing you. So you, in your head, you have already 
through so much trauma that you need to stand up so that the trauma doesn't continue. So I would rather stand up today and not be afraid about it rather than living in the fear for the rest of my life. So I have no doubt that you watched the Taliban uh, talk before the cameras and talk about, yes, women can work and they can go to school and they can join government, yeah, yeah. but uh, what is the meaning of, of the words that follow the but in that sentence for them? For example, they are saying girls can study, but then what sort of studying are you talking about? General education are we talking about? Are we talking about chronic studies? Are we talking about Sharia? Then we are talking about girls working or women working. So then there is a women working and start teaching in a madrasa, right? But that doesn't supplement for all the other professions that our world or our country needs to thrive, to survive, to stabilize. When you hear some news reports describe the new Taliban, what goes through you? Now they know how to speak English to the news channels, maybe. <laughs> I think we're all very well aware that the cameras are in Kabul right now. The eyes are on Kabul. But, but what is happening in the rural areas beyond the reach of cameras? What's your sense of specifically what is happening to women and girls there now? Girls right now are afraid to go out. I just talked to my staff member and he's like, you know, our, my niece, she doesn't want to go to school and ask him why. He's like, you know, because she's too afraid to go and she's just nine. So you have to understand that there is a difference in narrative. There is a difference in messaging, what they are trying to show to the world and what they are doing in person. The worse it appears in Afghanistan, the more you hear from average citizens all over the world and some human rights groups saying, what can we do? Where were you? Why couldn't you ask the Taliban not to abuse civilians, right? Not to make uh, refugee influx and crisis, right? So the world is pretty much every time late when it comes to the cry for help in Afghanistan's uh, uh, perspective. Pashtana, I have lots of little girls in my world and I know they will be watching you and they live very far away. And I wonder what, what you want them to think about tonight. They should know that the uh, Afghan women Afghan girls are not victims, right? They have been victimized into this, waged by men, white men, brown men, all different kinds of colors of men. And they have waged this war for far too long to make women silent, right? And they have been doing this for the past for the past few decades, right? And this is time for Afghan women to stand up and all the uh, women in the world, teenagers, girls, should stand by Afghan women in solidarity. Okay, Pashtana, thank you very, very much. We have a correction now about a story that aired in some editions of the program last night. The report about election battlegrounds incorrectly said the Tories swept Alberta and Saskatchewan in the 2019 election. In fact, the NDP won the riding of Edmonton Strathcona. Okay, still ahead, inside a community with one of the lowest vaccination rates in Ontario. Do you take pride in this area being one of the least vaccinated in Ontario? It's not about pride. We look at the efforts underway to convince the vaccine hesitants. And later, assessing the damage in BC's interior, wildfire evacuees get as close to their homes as they can. Welcome back. Much of Canada is now grappling with a fourth wave of COVID-19, so it's becoming increasingly important to boost vaccine uptake. But there's still millions of Canadians who remain skeptical or unconvinced to find out why, Ellen Morrow went to an Ontario farm town that's been a centre of resistance to COVID vaccination. A front line in the fight against COVID. This is a pop-up vaccine clinic in Elmer, southwestern Ontario, one of the province's least vaccinated areas. As the fourth wave grows, these workers know it's on them to help turn the tide. Outside, these residents do too, streaming in as soon as the doors open. 14-year-old Isaac Peters is getting his first shot. Little poke. It was just a needle. It helps the community out to get this coronavirus uh, out of this world and to help the older, elder people. These are the willing, but in this area, they're just barely a majority. I don't understand why it's such a big deal to some people, but for me, it's just, you know, you do what you can. Elmer is a 
a town of 7,500 nestled amid lush farmland deeply rooted in religion. Just over half of those eligible here and in the neighboring communities have received a vaccine. Compare that to about 80% across Ontario. It's all about trust. And continuing right now, to build it is crucial, the says the area's top so doctor. We do. Stigmatizing doesn't help. Judgment doesn't help. Support and education and reaching people where they're at does help. But those messages are struggling to get through. We talked to several people at this park. Most did not want to go on camera and most were either vaccine hesitant or outright opposed to getting a shot. Some said they don't fear COVID. Others said they don't trust the science. This father was the only parent here willing to speak publicly, echoing the sentiments we heard from so many others. I'm a little bit scared to get vaccine. If you look at the internet, it's like 50-50 people says like we have to get, and another 50% says like we don't because it makes uh, worse. So have you seen the statistics about how effective the vaccines are for reducing hospitalization and death? I didn't see that like uh, exactly the numbers, or, but I heard it was uh, cases the people get vaccine and they had some problem. And I'm not sure if it's fake or true. Welcome home. Has been a flashpoint throughout the pandemic. Last November, thousands gathered here for a so-called Freedom March, decrying masks and lockdowns as other residents staged a counter-protest. Many in the crowd belong to the Church of God Restoration, a controversial congregation led by Pastor Henry Hildebrandt. Freedoms are not theirs to take away from us. Christians died for it. People fought for it. Their freedoms are ours. Hildebrandt has repeatedly broken public health restrictions, opening the doors of his church even when it was prohibited, railing against governments and mainstream science. He's a divisive voice in the town, but one with hundreds of followers. Do you take pride in this area being one of the least vaccinated in Ontario? It's not about pride. It's not about pride. It's about saving lives. How and is it about saving lives? It's saving lives, lives because I will not be injected with something that you cannot prove to me is working or is safe. And I will not keep it to myself either. Why do you feel like you can say it's not a vaccine when people who've studied vaccines for decades are saying it is, a fa in fact, a life-saving vaccine? They're saying it because they know people like you will believe it. Okay, they know that the majority of the people will just blindly follow. I'm not one of them. Senator Lindsey Graham. He was vaccinated, fully vaccinated, but and he, Graham, got, he got COVID. He got, yes, but in his tweets announcing that he got COVID, he said that had he not had the vaccine, his symptoms would be much more severe. And he said he was happy that he got How the vaccine. How does he know? How does he know? Science. All I know, no, he's not science. If some here are intransigent, the push now is to appeal to the purely hesitant. This radio station broadcasts in low German. The language spoken by many in Elmer's large Mennonite community. It relays information from the local public health unit to the public. The misinformation, the, the, what do you want to call it, gossip? <laughs> and, it, and it spreads. Do you feel like your message is getting through over some of the misinformation that's out there? I would hope so. Um, I, I, I think it, it is, it's hard to measure, but I would really hope that people would, uh, some of these testaments that we're re relaying, that they would speak to, to that. Some community leaders have even broadcast their own vaccination experiences, trying to make it less daunting for others. Abe Harms is one of them. I always feel that this is the most effective is when we say what we've done. I'm one of the leaders in our Mennonite community and I got both shots, so uh, um, there are a lot of us that did. And so how do you try to appeal to those people in your community who are hesitant? Well, we're going to continue to do what we've done, uh, uh, stay with a consistent message, a message that uh, um, is always in, in line with uh, public health. and. Um, and so we're going to hope and uh, uh, pray that uh, uh, more people take it up. A hope fueled by those deciding just now to get their shot. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Aylmer, Ontario.
Up next, frustrated residents in BC have a message for their premier. He's on freaking holidays. Like he should be here, shouldn't he? Right? This is this is a disaster. It's a big one. We're on the ground with evacuees as the region still deals with an out of control wildfire. Europe is really struggling with wildfires this summer. Look at this, it's France. Thousands of people have been forced to flee due to a fast moving fire near Saint-Tropez. It broke out late Monday and by early Tuesday, the blaze had already burned 5,000 hectares. Officials say they've been able to stabilize the fire, but the risk remains high. Temperatures in the region have reached 40 degrees in recent days. Now in BC today, emergency officials informed dozens of people that they have lost their homes to wildfire. And as crews continue to battle those flames, thousands of people are still under evacuation alert. Brady Strachan spoke with some of those affected. This is as close as residents can get to the fire ground. They've been turning up here all day, hoping for a glimpse of what's left. Jerome Wochuk says his cottage is still standing, but the flames got close. We got really lucky. The, uh, the flames didn't cross the road and uh, they continued. They took off to the northwest. Father and son Doug and Travis Ferris have been trying since yesterday to check on their property. Came up here, tried to have a look in, but it was so smoky. And couldn't get any closer than this. And couldn't even see the houses for smoke. Smoke from the White Rock Lake fire still simmers on the hill behind. The fire is still classified as out of control. Wendy Underhill has been ordered to leave the area twice in the past two weeks. The stress is taking its toll. I had a meltdown yesterday. Total meltdown. I'm just tired. Today, emergency officials reached out to residents who lost their homes. At the roadblock, some are angry at Premier John Horgan over his summer vacation in the Maritimes. Or what about our Premier? He's on freaking holidays. Like, he should be here, shouldn't he? Right? This is, this is a disaster. It's a big one. Meanwhile, fire crews from across the province have come to battle a fire that has grown to several hundred square kilometres and is burning out of control. Fire officials say the cooler weather and rains over the past few days have given crews a much needed reprieve. However, they are expecting a return to warmer temperatures and gusting winds, which they say could lead to the kind of aggressive fire behavior that has been so destructive here. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Vernon, British Columbia. Okay, in just a moment, two vaccine clinic workers from Ontario are taking a shot at love. How dozens of people came together to make this unexpected moment next. Ryan Galway from Waterloo and his girlfriend of six years, they work together at a vaccine clinic. For the last several months, they've built memories and relationships there. So it's the perfect place for Ryan to propose to Jocelyn. So how'd that go? It's our moment. I started working with the um, clinic back when we were a smaller unit. I started working there in December and Ryan did back in March. We eventually knew we were going to have to expand. We need more people, reliable people. So, of course, I had to bring Ryan on board. We've been together for six years. I started um, thinking about the idea that I wanted to propose. So I had mentioned to a few co-workers that I wanted to do it at work. I had like a bunch of signs made up, like, will you marry me? They were all there in the morning ready to hold up signs and stuff. They all kept it a big secret. There was lots of communication between me and the boss and the workers. I was not expecting it, and I'll probably have this smile on for a really long time. They said there was not a dry eye in the building. I don't think I've seen that many people with that much support in a really long time. I can't think of a more amazing way to be proposed to other than having how many of your friends and people who love and support you being around you and being happy for you. Yeah, amazing. And Ryan was very good at keeping the secret. Jocelyn said she, she saw something was happening, wasn't sure what it was, hid behind her boss because she didn't want to steal someone else's money. <laughs> right, thinking yeah. it was actually a, an elaborate scheme for someone else. And, and they say, look, they're, they're very eager, of course, to get married, but they know that 
the actual ceremony. They don't think it'll happen for another few years because they want to have a big gathering with lots of people, mm -hmm. certainly lots of co-workers who would be invited to that. No kidding. Uh, congratulations, guys. That's The National for this August 17th. Have a great night. Good night.